I would like to introduce a very special guest that we have tonight, Tom Earnhardt, a graduate of Davidson College and UNC School of Law. Tom is an attorney with experience in state government, the corporate arena, private practice, and higher education. Under uh, Governor James Holzhauser, he worked with Secretary William Bondurant to protect the New River and to purchase much of the land that is now part of the Cape Lookout National Seashore. In Earnhardt's other life, he has been and continues to be an avid naturalist and advocate for the natural and cultural resources of North Carolina. Um, specifically over the past 18 years, Tom has crisscrossed North Carolina, researching, writing, and co-producing the five-time Emmy-nominated UNC TV series, Exploring North Carolina. In 2013, Tom, um, Tom completed a book of essays on the natural history of North Carolina, Crossroads of the Natural World. This will be coming out in paperback in spring of 2022, so keep a lookout. Um, and most recently, um, as the COVID pandemic spread in the spring of 2020, Tom wrote a series of 35 photo essays celebrating North Carolina's wild places and things, which ran on Sunday mornings on the opinion page of Capital Broadcasting and WRAL. Um, and the Coastal Land Trust has also um, posted this series of photo essays on our website. So we'll be sharing a link to that uh, later this evening. Do check it out. I've, I've really enjoyed reading those um, over the last year. Earnhardt has also received numerous awards for his work with cultural, historical, and natural resources, including the Governor's War Award as National North Carolina uh, sorry, North Carolina Conservationist of the Year in 1994, Audubon's Honorary Warden Award in 2004, and he received the Order of the Longleaf Pine in 2011. In October of 2016, he received the Flora Caroliniana Award for Habitat Restoration and Protection from UNC Chapel Hill's North Carolina Botanical Garden, which has only been given out four times over the last 50 years. Um, Tom lives in his in Raleigh with his wife, Dana Jennings. Their son, Isaac, is a graduate of Duke's uh, School of Law and is currently clerking on the First Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. And their daughter, Rachel, is a graduate student at Duke's uh, Nicholas School of the Environment. Tom, thank you for joining us today. I'll pass it over to you. Oh, I think you need to Am unmute I open? yourself. Hey, there you go. There you go. You're on. Unmute. Uh, can you hear me now? We got you. Thank you. Good. Lori, thank you very much. And I wish I was in the same place you were doing the introduction from. It'd be far nicer. Uh, I had promised myself back in the spring that I wasn't going to do any more virtual programs. I mean, it was, I was done with virtual programs after a year. And then, of course, we're back in the situation we're in, and there was absolutely uh, no equivocation on my part when uh, I was given the opportunity by Walker to uh, do a small program for the Coastal Land Trust. Um, I'm going to tell you about my heroes in a moment, but I am among my heroes right now on screen. When I look at the people at this meeting tonight, uh, you guys are at the top of the list. And let me tell you who you are included with. Um, you know, we all have sports heroes, the uh, Steph Curry's or the Michael Jordan's. Some of us uh, think about Bill Friday or uh, maybe a Dick Phillips, who um, was the Dean of the School of Law, a Fourth Circuit uh, judge and a fabulous naturalist. And, uh, Another hero that some of you may know is Betsy Bennett. I served on the board of the Museum of Natural Sciences while Betsy built not one, but two new museums in Raleigh over a 20 year period. Uh, just incredible, incredible insight and vision. And, and then there are cultural heroes and heroes that know probably more about the land than I'll ever know, like Dorothy Spruill Redford, Dorothy Redford lives in Terrell County, and she has written about her ancestors who were enslaved workers on the Somerset Plantation on what is now Phelps Lake. Um, Dorothy is one of those people 
who knows North Carolina better than any of us. Um, there were people that I never met who were in North Carolina and did extraordinary things outside and inside the state. Rachel Carson uh, spent time in North Carolina at Beaufort and at Lake Madame Mesquite before World War II. And of course, you know that she went on to write Silent Spring and she raised um, the alarm about um, the chemical, uh, chemical industry and what was happening to the environment and the fact that um, we might very well uh, lose a lot of the natural world that we know. Uh, and she was criticized for it at the time uh, tremendously. There was B.W. Wells, who I never met, but was one of the great naturalists of the 20th century. Uh, he taught at North Carolina State and wrote the book um, on the natural gardens of North Carolina. And those are the gardens just down the road from you, the green swamp and uh, the, the natural areas in the longleaf pine forest. But going back, um, and this started way back in college, uh, I fell in love with a group of people who had visited North Carolina, uh, the early naturalist, John and William Bartram. Uh, they, they were in Eastern North Carolina, uh, especially the, uh, uh, the younger Barton, William, uh, traveled all over North Carolina. And then you had Elisha Mitchell, uh, who taught at the University of North Carolina in the first half of the 1800s and explored much of the state. And there was another one that I, I put him at the top of the list. He was a French naturalist named Andre Michaud. Andre Michaud was here in the 1780s and 1790s, basically during the American Revolution and just after. And uh, he came to North Carolina seven times. He'd been all over the world. He was a Frenchman, but he was on the coast. He was in the mountains. And in August of 1794, he stood on what we now know as Grandfather Mountain. And he looked all around him and wrote in his journal, from this place, I can see more living things than exist in all of Europe from the capes of Scandinavia to the shores of Southern Greece. And he was correct. He was looking at the biodiversity of the Appalachians, but he had not, he had not been on the North Carolina coast. He had not been in a Longleaf Pine Forest or on the Black River or on the Roanoke River because he would have celebrated the same biodiversity. And that's why when you look at the people that I revere, that's why I'm so excited to be in this virtual room tonight with Camilla Herlovic, who's amazed us all for, gosh, three decades, and Janice Allen, and Lee Lighty, and Stephanie Brandt, and then Walker Golder and I met over two decades ago when I was on the board of Audubon. Of Audubon. Uh, Ann Simpson, who left your board just a while back, and I go way back to the Nature Conservancy, and then there's Linda Pearsall, who has not only been uh, not only been someone that I've uh, gone to forever, she's been a mentor to many of us on, in the natural world. And uh, then your current board and the people who've just stepped off, uh, Melanie Allen and, and Lori, uh, King, uh, Lori King, you are now going to lead the pack. There's Nancy Bray. And uh, then the one person, who probably knows more about North Carolina, uh, Stan Riggs. Stan Riggs and I worked in the ice ages together and we've known each other for just literally uh, going back into the, uh, oh, the, the late seventies, early eighties. But there can be no one who knows North Carolina better, especially the North Carolina coast. And that's why the Coastal Federation uh, and the land trust, the North Carolina land, uh, the Coastal Land Trust are so incredibly important to the people of North Carolina and coastal North Carolina. Now, you have preserved uh, between the, uh, the Virginia border and the South Carolina line and between uh, I-95 and the Atlantic Ocean, you've now, um, you've now preserved over 80,000 acres. Uh, that's, that's an incredible quantity of land. 
that's just about the same amount of land that North Carolina has in state parks in the same area. So you have, you have preserved privately uh, just an incredible amount of land. And think about the area that I just talked about from the Atlantic Ocean to I-95, Virginia border to the South Carolina line. When you measure the acreage in those 30, 31, 32 counties, it comes up to uh, the same as Massachusetts and Connecticut combined, or it's two New Jersey's. So you you guys have a lot of lot of responsibility. Two states worth worth of work to do by one organization. Uh, these are places of discovery, uh, places of enrichment, uh, places of inspiration that you have protected. Uh, cultural and natural uh, areas that will be part of North Carolina's uh, future. And uh, as many of you know, we've talked for, for a couple of years now in this country about uh, new infrastructure spending. Uh, the most important, important infrastructure that we can uh, 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 rebuild or protect is the natural world the natural world and the cultural resources of this state. So when I think about um, uh, uh, critical infrastructure, I think about the places, those 80,000 acres, that's critical infrastructure. Um, when doing exploring North Carolina for 18 years, um, I learned to do something that you do every day. And that is tell a story of a special place. Um, you have to spend time and place with the people who know it best, people who can tell, uh, tell a story, um, paint a picture in words that will convince others to go along, to follow. And uh, that's what you do every day. Uh, my first experience, and I was telling Walker about this the other day, my first experience in the land arena was when I worked with Governor Holshouser. He was a pretty informal guy and he would often just walk into your office early morning, mid-afternoon. And it was one morning I was, I got into the office, put on some coffee and he came in and said, you have an extra cup. And he sat down at the desk and he said, what do you know about Kate Lookout? And I, I had fished there off and on for a number of years. This is 1973. And he said, we need to buy uh, what remains in private land down there. There's a national seashore pending, but the state has to do its part and buy uh, the lands around the lighthouse, the Corbanks Gun Club, and, and a number of other lands, find out how much we bought of the private land. And the answer was none. We hadn't done anything yet. It had been passed in 1965. The General Assembly uh, that was in Congress, General Assembly thought it was a good idea, but it was now 1973 and we still hadn't progressed uh, to actually acquiring the land. Uh, and part of my work was to find out uh, who was going to support it. And the first person I went to uh, in the General Assembly was uh, Lieutenant Governor Jimmy Green. And I said, there's a great thing coming up. There's a national seashore that we're going to, uh, we're going to establish. And I need for you to help us pass the bill. And he looked at me and he said, why would anyone want to go to a sand pile that nobody can reach? It's covered with junk cars. Nobody wants to go out there. Why should we have a national seashore in a place that is uninhabitable? And all of a sudden I realized that my story and his story didn't match. And I found out very quickly that the folks in the General Assembly just on both sides of the aisle really didn't know much about Cape Lookout. Um, no donors, uh, no landowners uh, knew the story of why we wanted to put it in. So uh, I, went to Washington to visit with the guy named Roy Taylor, who was a congressman, a North Carolina congressman. And uh, he said, there's someone you have to meet. And I've invited him over to my office. And it was Pat Noonan, who had founded the Nature Conservancy. And Pat talked about storytelling. And we talked about how to tell the story 
of a of a place that we thought was worth saving. How do you tell that story? Uh, and you have to answer the who, the why, the what, and the where questions for everybody. And you have to make it appealing to donors, to politicians, and not just the conservation community. But that's what you've done um, with the coastal, uh, coastal Land Trust now um, since the early 1990s. You've told the story. You've told the story of why these places matter not just to Eastern North Carolina, but to North Carolina's future. While there, why, why places should be critical infrastructure for North Carolina. Um, the poet, um, Mary Oliver, probably encapsulated this, this, whole, um, this, this whole idea of storytelling in, a, uh, in basically three very short sen sentences. And she called it her advice for living a life. And she said, pay attention, be astonished, and tell about it. Pay attention, be astonished, and tell about it. And that's what you've done at the Coastal Land Trust every single day and every year. Because I know what, uh, when, when you talk to Linda Pearsall, when you talk to Camilla, when you talk to Walker, when you talk to Stephanie, the excitement comes through. They know the story and they know how to convince others that it's the, it's the right thing to do for North Carolina. And for the next few minutes, I'm going to uh, show you some of the places that I have been uh, privileged to visit, that I have been uh, allowed to share. Um, with others uh, for the last few years. Um, I got to go out this past year. A lot of these pictures were taken this last year and I'm gonna go to screen share now. A lot of these photographs were taken this last year during the pandemic. And um, can everybody see the very first image is, a, is an egret. Can everyone see the, see the bird on the screen? Yeah, it looks good, Tom, thanks. Okay. Let's see. The first thing I want you to just grasp very quickly, and you all know this, North Carolina is in a sweet spot. We are, we are right in the middle of the East Coast of the United States. And that line that runs in, uh, in Northern Carteret County, that line off the Atlantic Ocean, uh, is the 35th parallel. And that's really the epicenter of the temperate zone. And that means that North Carolina is sort of in the center of, of where things happen. Um, we have running right up to North Carolina, we have the Gulf Stream from the South, and we have the Labrador Current from the North, and they clash off of Cape Hatteras and Cape Lookout. And that's the reason our coast has uh, shellfish that are primarily northern and primarily southern, uh, game fish and, uh, and commercial fish that are primarily northern or primarily southern. And that's the reason that our ecosystems are both subtropical, temperate, and subarctic. Um, several of you, have, I've, I've make, tried to make this point a number of times over the years, but this is obviously, this is on bald head. Um, this is the northern range for palm trees, uh, southern, uh, the southern part of our coast. And these wonderful palm uh, savannas and palm forest um, on Bald Head and just a little farther north are unique. And it is subtropical. And not only palm trees, but we have another subtropical critter that really stopped in North Carolina, the alligator. And there are birds that nest as far as North Carolina. They are Southern creatures that come up and this is one of our, uh, this, the, they used to nest here and now they've come back up. Uh, this is a wood stork, one of the most spectacular birds. This is, uh, this is on a um, uh, Carolina Bay near Lumberton. And 
Some people are squeamish about spiders, but this is one of my favorites. Uh, it's a golden orb weaver, and it's found from the Noose River south. You, hard, you, you do not find these guys north of the Noose, Noose River. They may cross it uh, in a few places, but it is primarily Noose River south. This is a subtropical spider. And just a couple slides from the mountains, what differentiates the coast? You know the Piedmont, we get up to a few hundred feet, but then the mountains, we have 43 peaks over 6,000 feet and 150 over 5,000. And you are literally in Boreal Forest. You go from Wilmington, uh, Bald Head Island and, uh, and the plants that you find at uh, Carolina Beach State Park, subtropical, all the way to uh, southern Canada or even Maine. This is the this is the type of ecosystem that you'll find in the far north. That yet it's four and a half hours from Wilmington. This is a saw wet owl that breeds in North Carolina, but you find these far far to the north. Uh, but this is this is the last place that you find them, uh, and this is a natural habitat for them. Not a gray squirrel, but a northern red squirrel found above 5,500 feet. This is what makes North Carolina so spectacular. So let's go back to your land. This is the, the land of the, of the Coastal Land Trust. Virginia border to South Carolina line, Atlantic Ocean to I-95. Uh, Virginia, not Virginia, but uh, Massachusetts and Connecticut. I can start in the ocean and do a lot of comparisons of fish species north and south, but let's go up on the beach. Um, there's, there are things that we all, uh, whether it's a, uh, it, might, it might be a, uh, a sandpiper, might be uh, terns, um, they're fairly common. But then on some beaches, we get very excited when we see these guys, the black skimmers and birds that um, are not that common anymore. They have to have special beaches and Audubon and the Land Trust have worked together in places like Lee, uh, Utah Island. These are places where these birds will thrive and where we can continue to see these incredibly special creatures. And um, these are also places where something else magical happens where we have the chance to see turtles that will go to the ocean and some of them will become international travelers and then come back to North Carolina. And uh, we, we, we've all seen uh, many of the species of turtles, normally the loggerheads and the green turtles or the, um, or the hawksbill. But for years, I used to see the Cape Lookout leatherbacks. I saw many, many leatherbacks and uh, that's not one that normally nests in North Carolina, but we have to have uh, coastal waters that are receptive to all these turtles and make sure that uh, the habitats are protected. Um, when you see something like this, it looks like a jumble, but I know to Coastal Land Trust, this, this, is, this is what you what you're in business for. The Atlantic Ocean off to the left, um, you have a, I, I can turn it over to Stan Riggs right now and have him talk about this, the surf and then the dune line and then behind the dunes you've got the uh, maritime forest and then you've got the, uh, the marsh. All different um, uh, ecosystems and all of them are different communities. But I'm going to, uh, you know, whenever I go to coastal North Carolina, there's there are things that I look for. And when I go to Bald Head or when I go to Carolina Beach State Park or Fort Fisher, I'm looking for uh, some, of the, some of the dense uh, maritime forest. This is one from Bald Head, uh, given away by a palm tree. But these are places that all of us have the chance to see some of our favorite creatures. Whether it's, um, this, is, this is one that I make at least two trips a year just to spend a half day uh, with painted bunnies. And just absolutely nothing more spectacular. Uh, all of you have seen them. You've probably got them uh, at your homes near Wilmington. But whenever I see these, I just count my lucky stars that I live in North Carolina.
But then I count my lucky stars every time I'm on a salt marsh behind the barrier islands. Uh, it was uh, in 1971 uh, with my dad when we saw some birds flying. If you look at the dunes straight across, there's the back of a dune straight across that salt, salt marsh. This was at Cape Lookout. And we saw what we thought were parakeets. And we told all of our friends we saw parakeets. And of course, they were painted bunnings on core banks. So, uh, but again, the salt marsh is the beginning of life for a lot of creatures. And uh, they change colors, they change completely, they die back uh, in the winter. And the home to countless uh, shellfish and birds, the um, oyster catcher here. And then on the higher spots, you'll have, uh, you'll have pelicans. And then occasionally you come to a place that is just something that's just out of place. Uh, this is in Core Sound. Uh, I spent a lot of time at Cape Lookout. And this was, this was up the coast just from Marshallburg um, in the marsh behind Core Banks. And a lot of the locals called it Ruth's Chimney. Turned out that Babe Ruth used to play, uh, who played baseball in the 20s, used to hunt on the Outer Banks. And some of the places that he would hunt would be from Marshallburg all the way up to Cedar Island. And these were chimneys of some of the old hunt clubs. And uh, some of them were very small, just a place to get out of the wind for the day, but they built these elaborate fireplaces. And then we have, occasionally you'll see something that reminds us of the wooden boat days, a boat that just got abandoned, a beautiful cedar strip, uh, uh, probably juniper strip boat in the marsh. And then something surprising happens. You go down the, you go down the canal and just where it enters a little deeper water, manatees. And on three occasions I've, bumped into manatees in North Carolina. This is part of what makes us unique. This, this area, this temperate zone that is a mix of subtropical uh, and the colder water of the North, but we can have manatee coming all the way to North Carolina. And a place that I love to spend time and this could be one of several. I, I go to the Sand Hills. I go to uh, Green Swamp. I go to uh, go uh, to the uh, Croatan Forest. This is um, this is just up the road from Supply. This is not actually in the Green Swamp yet, but there's some things that I just can't wait to see each year. You look across, and every one of you know that they look boring from the road just an endless endless stand of, of trees separated by grass. But look a little closer and you'll see uh, just a huge variety of birds. And this is the uh, red cockaded woodpecker and countless stories you could, all of us could do uh, uh, a day on red cockaded woodpeckers. But for me during the year, um, I love to think about uh, the wildflower changes. There's this whole calendar of wildflowers that start in the spring, go to the fall. This was a couple of weeks ago, um, blazing star. And the Venus flytraps have turned now. They've gotten just rich red, especially those that are in the sun. And uh, they're in the sphagnum moss. And when you look, you look at this, the amount of plant life and even animal life in that wire grass is just almost beyond comprehension. And these are things that, again, you know that they're 75, this is a 75 mile radius of Wilmington. And uh, one of the things that has attracted me over and over again, and I take a tripod and lay on my stomach, a small tripod will be the orchids, the pink grass. And this was last week. This is a, um, uh, this is a uh, fringed, white fringed orchid. Look at them from different angles. Or the yellow fringed orchid. And again, look at them from on, on high. Or a fringeless yellow orchid. And again, they're 
uh, probably a dozen different types that go along with our uh, carnivorous plants found there. And then one of my favorites, and um, this is something that comes out usually from late, uh, late, late July, all the way through August, and this was still up last week. Uh, these are Catesby's lily. And then, this was last year, this is something that um, a lot of us say, oh my gosh, I don't want to ever see one of those. This means that we have a reasonably healthy ecosystem there. This is an incredible animal. And um, as much time as I've spent outdoors, I've never come close to being bitten by a rattlesnake. Uh, they move away if they hear you coming. If you're walking with a walking stick, they won't bother you. I actually saw him moving through the grass and I tapped the stick in, in front of him and got him to pose. But um, this is part of a healthy ecosystem. It does not mean uh, danger. It does not mean it's a terrible place. This means that the ecosystem is largely intact. And uh, just, up, um, just up the road um, from the Green Swamp, um, you've got a number of Carolina Bays, and I know that you work in Carolina Bay country. You have the chance to see some of the most wonderful rookeries in Eastern North Carolina uh, for ibis. No, excuse me, the, uh, these, these are uh, uh, great egrets. And then you get to the, these are the wood storks. And uh, they just fill the treetops. Just absolutely glorious animals. And then in the sky, they really are just stunning. But the place that I probably spend collectively more time is on the rivers of Eastern North Carolina. I've met Stan Riggs a dozen times in the last two years at the mouth of the Roanoke. We'll go from the Roanoke and we'll go up uh, to the uh, Chuan. This happens to be on the Roanoke. Um, could be the Tar. This is on the Tar River. Um, and there's some very large uh, Tupelo on the Tar. And um, in these places, you have the chance to see something uh, common. You see, occasionally you'll see, uh, you know, just a variety of turtles. You'll see great blue herons and lots of osprey now. And as all of you know, the osprey now have, um, uh, have, uh, have come back since the 1970s. And we have this incredible array of eagles now. Eagles on all of our, all of our Eastern rivers and on our southeastern rivers, and then in some of the, um, some of the uh, Albemarle Peninsula Eagle uh, rivers, we have alligators, and then something um, sometimes very special uh, shows up, uh, a yellow-crowned night heron. This was, this was near Greenville. But the Black River uh, is a favorite, and I'll just tell you just a little bit, all of you who've been on the Black River or been or crossed it, the oldest trees in Eastern America. And this is a place where it's not just the trees, you've got an incredible array of wildflowers from spider lilies to on the banks above. Uh, this is uh, called a, a lady lupin or a hairy lupin, absolutely glorious. And this is the same, the same plant. This is the same plant when it goes to seed. And this is the land of the Pythonotary Warbler. And you wonder what the Pythonotary Warbler eats. And they eat caterpillars. And they feed caterpillars to their young. And um, Audubon tells us that for each warbler chick, it takes a thousand caterpillars. So when we talk about an ecosystem uh, being complete, you can't just have birds without caterpillars, without the right plants. And that's what the Coastal Land Trust has done in protecting ecosystems, especially when it's a natural ecosystem you're protecting. And this is part of the ecosystem too, a yellow rat snake that has to make a living, as does the Cooper's hawk on the Black River. And then you have a world of owls. 
Uh, I don't know that I've been down there more than a couple of times without seeing usually multiple owls in the trees watching. And then the woodpeckers on the Black River. And there's something new since 2015. And that's this guy. Uh, these are the uh, swallow-tailed kites that have shown up on the Black. And by the way, they're now nesting on the Black River and the Cape Fear. Uh, it's a, it's, uh, this is another bird that sort of defines North Carolina as, bound, as, as a boundary state. But um, in the last minutes here, I just want to share with you a, um, a couple of places that to me are among North Carolina's most special, and it's in your territory. This is the Albemarle Peninsula. Uh, this is Phelps Lake in the evening at sunset, but the skies are especially clear because there, as you probably know, this is the darkest sky uh, in North Carolina, all over the Albemarle Peninsula, almost no light pollution. This is the land of bears, it's the land of otters, but it's also a land filled with blackbirds these winter flocks, these mixed flocked blackbirds, and these are mostly red wings that fly along the side of the road. And then come the birds of winter, uh, a whole slew of ducks, including these, um, these are spoonbills among the tundra swans. And then on a really good day, something special happens and you see birds that you haven't seen often. And these, uh, these are cranes, these are sandhill cranes. And I've seen cranes now in varying numbers for the last seven or eight years. And I hope our population's growing. And then tundra swans that uh, come from uh, the Canadian tundra, some of them as far away as, uh, as Siberia. They come in families. They, uh, they rest together, they, get, uh, they spend the winter together before they fly back. And they fill the skies. If you have not, those of you who live in Wilmington, if you haven't spent a, an early morning to late evening uh, on one of Lake Madame Mesquite or, um, or Pocosin Lakes Refuge, please do so this winter or soon. This is one of the great sites in not just Eastern North Carolina and Eastern America. When you see a, the ground covered and the sky filled, this is what um, a couple of my friends have called North Carolina's Yellowstone. And it goes throughout the day and throughout the night. And if you stay just a little bit longer, if you stay into the evening, sometimes you'll get lucky and uh, you'll see a full moon with that really clear sky. And if you watch closely, I told you the birds fly at night. Sometimes the swans will fly under the moon. Some of them will fly over the moon and some of them will try to land on the moon. There is no place like Eastern North Carolina this is one of the spots that I visited frequently. This is, uh, this is near your Salmon Creek Site X that you all made possible, looking down the sound 60 miles from the Atlantic Ocean. But you're still at sea level and people forget that, that you can, you can leave the ocean and 50, 60 miles away, you're still at sea level. This is the Albemarle Sound and this is fresh water. And right behind, this is what this you're looking to the east and look right behind you and you're looking up a cliff. This is one of the cliffs uh, near Cold Rain. And these can be 60, 70, 80 feet sand cliffs that are among the most spectacular features on the North Carolina coast. And this is what it looks like from on top. This is, this is, a, uh, this is a view in Eastern North Carolina looking across the, um, the Chowan River. And this is what the beach looks like. It's a rocky beach with, um, with a lot of, fossil, of uh, fossils and shells. And then you see Stan Riggs' hand 
pointing to any number of there, there's there are a variety of shells, of course, and there's plenty of uh, coral indicating that seas have gone up and down and that North Carolina's coast is among the most static, uh, not, uh, dynamic, not static places on earth. And this is the North Carolina coast. When people usually think of the white sandy beaches, this is also sea level. That's what makes it unique. I could take you to the Northern Outer Banks, to Jockey's Ridge. I could take you on up to Kerala, to the, to the stumps, but I'm gonna just uh, close by taking you just up the road um, from uh, Edenton, and this is Merchant's Mill Pond. And in Merchant's Mill Pond, um, you're likely to see uh, turtles. You'll have a mix of uh, northern and southern, uh, southern trees. You still have cypress. You still have tupelo. And among the most beautiful places, this is near the Virginia border, but I told you that North Carolina is that last range, and this is where you have the last gasp. You have the last alligators that I know of, or that um, I don't know of alligators that appear naturally north of this. North Carolina is a boundary state. It is that sweet spot between, between Arctic and, uh, and tropical. And again, you and the land trust have learned to tell the story. You've learned to look at the whole flock and pick out the right bird and tell that bird's story, the one that could reach the moon, because you guys have done it over and over and over again. And it is such a privilege to be with you this evening. Thank you very much.